the spring of 2013, members of our thinking community gathered at the Geography of Hope Conference in Point Reyes, California. This year's conference was entitled Igniting the Green Fire, Finding Hope in Aldo Leopold's Land Ethic. The following presentation by Gary Paul Nabhan, ecologist, ethnobotanist, and writer, addresses the topic of hope, happiness, and prosperity, creating a restorative economy. Where are the most urgent needs for healing the land and healing in our communities? Take a minute and ask yourself, if you had a limited amount of time, where would you focus the healing that you feel you can be part of? In this community, in the communities that you've lived in in the past. I think when we talk about a res uh, the kind of ecological restoration that Aldo Leopold envisioned of healing the land and ask if it, whether, it, whether it can translate to greater happiness, greater true prosperity of the kind that I think uh, Leslie and John have spoken of, and a restorative economy, we need to ask how the land healing can translate into the healing of human health and community health, uh, whether that community health is de defined exclusively as economic well-being or the, all of the dimensions that our wonderful speakers have spoken about this morning. And where, when I think about where the healing is most urgent, where I live on the U.S.-Mexican border, I, I think about um, three kinds of healing. Uh, right after I moved into my house, I saw uh, a hummingbird, one of the migratory pollinators that comes through our area, um, die in one of the bushes in front of our house because it had starved to death on the way up into the United States on its migratory corridor for lack of the nectar resources uh, that uh, would formerly fuel that migration all the way up through here and all the way to Sitka, Alaska. Rufus Hummingbird died in my hand. At the same time, I think about the 60% uh, of the Mexican and Mexican-American people along the border who say that they suffer regular food insecurity and 30%, uh, 35% of the kids in schools that they say they come to school with outright hunger, uh, even in this land of prosperity as, as we call the United States, uh, Mexican-American kids on this side of the border a third of them suffering um, hunger on a daily or weekly basis. And I think about the um, healing that has to go on in the border communities with the near assassination of our own Congressman Gabby Giffords a few years ago and the violent uh, debate happening about immigration and how that affects not just those of us in Arizona but every place in the country. So, so, again, my question comes back to how do we think about um, restoration, not just as planting plants out or putting gabions in watersheds that have had uh, down cutting occur over the decades or centuries uh, to restore watershed health, but, but how do we link that to restoring uh, true health in our communities that have been wounded by past conflicts in current conflicts and bring us all to a, a state of fuller health and, and prosperity. And if I can say uh, the word that I think I feel on the tips of all our tongues due to the beautiful gifts that the speakers have given us this morning, the possibility of joy, <laughs> that word that I think brings us all here. Um, so. What you get when you ask that question, whether ecological restoration can translate to uh, uh, 
community restoration and uh, a restorative economy d depends on on who you're listening to, where you hear that those needs being most urgent. And, and I think I want to talk about how the key to that generating that restorative economy may be listening to, to who has the most need, how we can be part of the solution to meeting those needs. Once upon a time, 80 years ago, Aldo Leopold, who is already one, considered one of the great ecological scientists of the uh, country, uh, took some time off from being uh, a leader to being a community member of sorts in the larger community of Wisconsin by meeting on a regular basis in a coffee shop in the morning with farmers, livestock producers, uh, soil conservationists, community foresters um, in that community that uh, Paul Johnson and Kurt Miney have studied to a greater extent than I had, the, the Coon Creek uh, community in Wisconsin in the Driftless area. And so here's a, here's a guy at the height of his professional career driving out of Madison and, and sitting in a coffee shop and listening to farmers and other people about what they wanted to do given the state of gully erosion, the depletion of wildlife in that area. And rather than being in the command control position in that situation, he listened. He listened like he'd listened to those birds that he drew when he was 11 years old in Burlington, Iowa. And um, some of those meetings were weekly, getting people together in a rural coffee shop just to listen to one another and build consensus on what should be done for their land and the community. That consensus has built into what they then called the cooperative conservation movement into something far greater that I think is the greatest thing that's happened in the last 30 years in conservation, and that's the community-based collaborative conservation movement that Susan Flatter referred to uh, yesterday in terms of um, Paul Hawkins' idea of the blessed unrest, that we now have more grassroots organization interacting for social justice and environmental justice in their communities than ever before in human history. It's the largest voluntary social movement in human history since the beginning of the species. Okay? That movement there in the Coon Creek watershed voluntarily involved 400 farmers and 200 other workers in that community to restore over 40,000 acres of land. So the question is, in, you know, 80 years later, did that really help the community economy of uh, the Coon Creek, Kickapoo River, Driftless region of Wisconsin? The remarkable thing that, that Kurt, Kurt helped me realize is that now that um, same area is one of the core areas for this incredible co-op that many of you have heard of called Organic Valley that had names, other names early on, the uh, organic produce pool when farmers started to gather together to think about now that they restored their land, how they, can they restore their economy? And that very same area that Leopold worked in uh, 60 to 80 years ago is now one of the most thriving rural economies in the United States with Organic Valley generating over $70 million of annual revenues to the farmer shareholders involving over 1,200 farmers and helping healthy food reach hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of, of people. So there's a time lag before we restore the land to when it spills over into restoring our economies and our human health. But I think the very area where th that was the seed of the collaborative conservation movement 
uh, at Coon Creek has played a key role in showing that there is a tangible connection between these two. That's inspired um, me to sit in a coffee shop once a week in a town of 800 people called Patagonia, Arizona, uh, 10 miles north of the border in one of the poorest counties in the United States, 30% uh, unemployment after the 2009 downturn, 30% of the houses vacant, average household income, $18,000 a year, uh, $18,000 a year, and um, two out of 10 people living in Nogales, uh, the, the county seat, um, undocumented, so-called illegal, unable to fearing that if they ask for government services to feed their kids or go to a health clinic or whatever, they might be arrested and exported. So a real need there, and we listen each week to the needs of farmers, ranchers, and other people that come to this meeting in our little coffee shop 80 years after Aldo Leopold and his friends made that same kind of gesture. There's farmers and ranchers there. There's restoration ecologists, people that run after school programs for kids who don't get enough food at home, conservation biologists, rural sociologists. And what we're aiming at is what we call food chain restoration. Restoring the chain so that the consumer, I hate that word, the eater, the eater's needs are met, whether it's that hummingbird or whether it's the six-year-old kid with English as a second language that are in our local schools that's coming to school hungry. How can we have a kind of restoration that meets their needs, deep needs? And so we're working on what we're calling a food and fertility hub that will include a farmer incubator. We've already gotten school kids and unemployed people in our community back growing uh, food and training others to grow food in a series of, of gardens and hoop houses around our community. But a food and fertility hub where we're also um, restoring the soil that's been sloughed off or skimmed off the land over the last hundred years, a composting facility, a grass hay facility for grass-fed beef, uh, uh, a nursery of native plants that grow out the, the seedlings of pollinator attracting plants. We're putting five to 10,000 of those plants back on the floodplain in riparian zones so that I don't have to see another dead hummingbird in my yard again. And at the same time we're restoring the food chain for that pollinator, we're trying to restore the food chain for the humans in our county. And whether we're successful or not, depends whether we listen to where those needs are, those deep needs, the deep hunger in our communities. And I think it means that we have to remember that Leopold was right about having community probably is the most frequent word in Sand County Almanac. It's the most frequent word in that book whether it's the land community or other way, ways that he use it, that America has prided itself on its rugged individualism and now we know there is no such thing as an individual, that each of us is a wildlife community, a land community with 100,000 more cells of other organisms in and on the cells of our own body than the cells of our own genome that each of us have been influenced in our evolution by this cohabitation, by this community that lives in and on us and sometimes in spite of us or despite us. And that now we're talking about a definition of community that opens itself up to people of color, to microbes that we've ignored, to the neglected and to the marginalized. And I take this personally down on the border. My grandfather was an immigrant, didn't get his papers until after he was 65 years of age. He was one of those nasty illegals 
that uh, come into this country without our government's permission. 500 of my relatives, including my great-grandfather, um, tried to migrate through Mexico as refugees into the United States. And to have justice for those people and justice for that hummingbird is the goal that drives me. Thank you. This production was made possible by the use of the facilities and services of the Community Media Center of Marin and through a partnership of the Center for Humans and Nature, the Aldo Leopold Foundation, the United States Forest Service, and Point Reyes Books. For more information and videos, and to join our thinking community, visit humansandnature.org.